Great. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Appreciate it. Welcome back from the break. Hopefully your bladders will allow your brain to sort of cooperate with this uh, presentation. Certainly we have had obstetric anesthesia guidelines in the past. In fact, in 1998, there was a set of guidelines and then it was rewritten. I was part of that rewriting group. There were eight physicians on that group um, and we wrote them in 2006. But in terms of different types of guidelines, I know many of you have your own practices that are very good. You deliver high quality analgesia and anesthesia. You have very few complications, if any, and life proceeds quite well. But we do have these guidelines and we have to think about them, especially when it comes time of trouble, because we want to see what's in the background and what's uh, helping us or hurting us. But in clinical practice, we certainly appreciate that sometimes not all of these guidelines apply to us. And as such, we have to be thoughtful about how we apply them and what guidelines we should incorporate into our practice. But there is a gap between evidence and practice. And that gap begins with the research. And after research is formulated, um, there's the presence of guidelines that a lot of different societies or a lot of different practice groups come up with, or even your own local institution has some guidelines that you apply yourself to. And finally, from those guidelines, we derive our practice. And there's a whole science out there called implementation science that looks at the delay between when there's a predominance in research indicating a certain direction, and finally, when we incorporate that into practice. And in terms of that gap, so moving through the T1 and the T2 is a period of 17 years. Uh, it's quite amazing that it takes that long. And as such, when we think about 2006 guidelines, they're just seven years old, not that old. And many of you might think, well, they are seven years old, so maybe I don't need to read them if I didn't initially. I know I sometimes think about guidelines that way. but. We're going to assess now whether or not they are effective, whether intervening research has intruded upon the truth of those guidelines, and then finally how they defend or support our own practice. So what exactly are these guidelines and what do they look like? And in thinking about this, we realize that guidelines fall into that small sliver between standards and advisories. Standards are things that you must absolutely do, um, Kenneth talked about this just a little bit in terms of basic monitoring. I mean, very few of us would come into an OR these days and say, you know, I'm just not feeling it. I don't think I'm going to be using monitors today. I think I'll just use drop sevoflurane on a little mask. I mean, most of us wouldn't apply ourselves to that sort of approach. Moreover, they are not advisories, and advisories are those situations where probably there is mechanistic suggestions, but still not enough literature. For example, if you put pressure on the eyeball for a long period of time, it probably leads to ischemia of the eyeball and problems with the eyeball. And yet there's been insufficient literature evidence to suggest that it's true, and probably we'll never get there because nobody wants to put pressure on their eyeball for a long period of time. So practice guidelines exist in that middle sort of world. And with this, we understand that they are recommendations to our practice. And we see recommendations, we identify that they articulate a management strategy. There's literature support for most of the guidelines that are articulated, that they can be altered based on local needs or restraints. And finally, that over time, there is an evolution in those guidelines and whether or not they're applicable to common practice. To bring you through the process, there's basically seven steps where there's a collection of data. And we looked at over 4,000 citations, looked at 3,000 articles. And from that, we derived these guidelines. What we included were those individuals that were pregnant. And we limited it to these four different characteristics. And we excluded different patient populations as well, especially those obstetric patients that were coming in for non-obstetric type surgeries, as well as different types of chronic diseases, as well as analgesic opportunities in the post-operative period. 
So with that, we come to the guidelines. And more specifically, we understand that there are seven guidelines. They range all the way from preoperative evaluation, all the way to the handling of emergencies. They talk about labor analgesia, as well as cesarean delivery anesthesia. And in looking at them, and looking at how they compare to 1998, when the first guidelines were written, and now in 2006, there are some that were not changed, and I've created some icons to let you know the difference, those that did change in the interval, and finally, those that were new in 2006 that we added to the guidelines, something that had not been mentioned before. In evaluating perianesthetic sort of approaches, I pose you a few questions, and this is probably the best way to think about the guidelines and whether they are still relevant to our practice. And when we think about this, we ask the question, is a routine platelet count necessary? We had some guidance today given by Mark and by Kenneth, um, but is there an acceptable literature value that we should append ourselves to? Moreover, should routine typing screens or typing processes be performed? And finally, in terms of fetal heart rate monitoring, should we do it before every analgesic technique or any anesthetic adventure that we apply ourselves to? In terms of what the guidelines say, they say that a routine platelet count is not necessary, especially for healthy parturients. And this is in part given the nature of the, the thrombocytopenia that we see. Only 8% of individuals have thrombocytopenia during the course of their pregnancy. Now, we may think of it as being a higher number. Certainly, we have all seen patients with preeclampsia, immune thrombocytopenic purpura, gestational thrombocytopenia. But there, in fact, if you look cross-sectionally, only 8% of individuals are affected by thrombocytopenia during pregnancy. Moreover, we should individualize the platelet count. And a specific count, as articulated very well by Mark and by Kenneth, is not predictive of anesthetic complications when you introduce a needle into the back. In terms of type and cross, type and screen, once again, a routine cross match is not necessary here. And it should be used when in those cases where there's direction by the maternal history or anticipated hemorrhagic sort of complications. In terms of fetal heart rate monitoring before we intervene with the neuraxial technique or otherwise, um, it should be monitored before and after the technique. However, continuous monitoring is oftentimes not able to be performed, and we recognize that. Looking at aspiration prophylaxis, this is something that's very different from country to country when you think about what happens in the UK or Canada, Australia, New Zealand, even Latin America. We all have different precepts on what the parturient should be able to take or not. And the questions that we pose here is, should there be a difference in laboring women? How about before elective surgery? And we apply that same thought process when we think about solid foods. And then we compare it to the other guidelines that are available for our use. And when we think about clear liquids, as mentioned by Kenneth earlier on, um, modest amounts can be utilized in laboring women, recognizing that labor can slow down the process of labor, uh, process of gastric emptying. However, it's pretty minimal, and by two hours, most of the gastric contents have um, sort of passed through the system. There are some provisos, women at risk of aspiration, women who have other um, processes in their stomach, like reflux, um, that might be at play, or women who have high risk of operative events. You may want to lengthen those guidelines a little bit more. <clears throat> in terms of solids, these also should be avoided in laboring women. For elective surgeries, we stipulate a period of six to eight hours, and that was based on some evidence looking at the lipid content of the food. Now, I don't really analyze the food that people eat, and I uh, don't apply myself to six hours sometimes and eight hours other times. I generally just say eight hours, and that just clarifies everything uh, for the, my obstetric colleagues. And we should think about, and this was changed, uh, in the 2006 guidelines, the use of antacids, H2 antagonists, and metoclopramide. How has changed was an appreciation of the time frame associated with these drugs. Bicitra has an activity half-life of about 30 minutes. Beyond that time frame, it's not going to help you a whole lot. 
metoclopramide in order to be a prokinetic agent needs about 30 minutes to work. So when I enter a room thinking about a cesarean delivery, metoclopramide is the first agent that I employ. And as we get closer to the time of surgery, then I use Bicitra. And just how it compares to the other guidelines, this, these are the ASA practice guidelines for preoperative fasting, and they indicate all the exclusions that we've just talked about. Pregnancy, obesity, emergency care, and then where airway management might be difficult. So there is no conflict here. It says that the guidelines for obstetric anesthesia practice are foremost and real and are comparable to the guidelines that are otherwise um, been bandied about. So how about anesthetic care for labor? And when we think about this, we need to consider whether or not we should have a set amount of fluids that is given prior to the administration of a Miraxil technique. We can even think of it th about this in terms of the labor approach, but we can also think about this in terms of cesarean delivery. We can also think about Neuraxil analgesia, and the perennial question among our obstetric colleagues, and we thought this was answered in 2006 when guidelines were issued by ACOG about cervical dilatation and then this relationship to cesarean delivery, and finally whether or not repeat spinals is an optimal practice. And when we look at this an overview of analgesic care during labor, we understand that the treatment of complications should be readily available on your labor floors. And in part, this was derived from the fact that there are some people that had high spinals when they're trying to do labor analgesia, and yet they had no ambu bag, no mechanism of providing oxygen for laboring women. Moreover, there are some situations where people do these blocks, but they have no phenylephrine or ephedrine readily available to counteract some of the hypotension that occurs. An intravenous infusion should be in place when you do a technique, and a fixed volume of fluids is not required before a labor analgesic or a cesarean delivery anesthetic. And to this, I would encourage your attention to a, a very nice editorial by Frederick Mercier, and basically what he demonstrated and he recalled in a historical way was the studies that have been done. And the first line of studies were comparing crystalloid preloading versus colloid preloading. And when we think about the two and you use different amounts of crystalloid, um, we in our group uh, did a number of studies looking at 10 milliliters per kilo, 20 milliliters per kilo, and even 30 milliliters per kilo. And you compare it to colloid preloading, where you can use 500 milliliters or even up to a liter of HETA starch. What these studies indicated was that colloids were more effective as a preload. And in fact, crystalloid preloading did not work very well, or it was very temporary in nature. So the second generation of studies looked at whether or not crystalloid preloading was any different than what's called co-loading. And what co-loading is, is that time of your spinal anesthetic or your analgesic for labor that you administer a rapid amount of fluid. Now, different amounts that have been studied include 10 milliliters per kilo or 20 milliliters per kilo. And it seems to indicate that if you do 20 milliliters per kilo over a 10 to 15 minute period, as you inject your spinal anesthetic, that that can help prevent hypotension. So a third generation of studies came around that if co-loading seems to work with crystalloids, how well does it work with colloids? And when we think about this, we, we recognize that colloids have a, a longer dwell time intravascularly. And these comparisons between the two showed no difference. So that you can use a colloid, you can use it preload or as a co-load. Um, its effective half-life is nice because it can maximize its effects and still have its effects present on cardiac output at a later point in time. And the best sort of evidence for this was a paper by a guy named Uyama who looked at cardiac outputs and indicated that most colloids stayed intact 45 minutes intravascularly in the, the perturian system. A final generation of studies then looked at crystalloid co-loading and compared it to colloid co-loading. And these indicated, once again, that colloids were superior than crystalloids in maintaining blood pressure. 
So overall, what we would suggest is that with someone where you're very concerned about cardiac output and maintenance of blood pressure, for example, someone that has aortic stenosis, that you may want to employ a colloid. I would sometimes give that colloid in advance in, in preparation of my neuraxial technique, and that will help maintain the cardiac output that we see so vital. In terms of timing of neuraxial analgesia and outcomes, and this addresses the issue of whether or not um, it should be withheld until a certain cervical dilatation has been achieved. Earlier ACOG statements indicated that you should wait until they reach the cervical dilatation of four to five centimeters. In 2006, the ASA and ACOG got together, we looked at the evidence, and we came to the inclusion that you no longer have to wait. But I will say what is fascinating, and Craig Palmer sits on the ACOG committee, is just recently there have been a lot of obstetricians that have been asking for this to be revised to reinstitute the idea that you have to work for a, surf, a certain cervical dilatation before you receive a neuraxial technique for labor. So luckily we've been able to push those aside based on evidence, but dark and evil forces are among us. So be, stay tuned, we'll, we'll keep on fighting the good fight there. But in terms of whether or not they change the instance of cesarean delivery, there's no argument there. Our obstetric colleagues tend to agree with us here. Um, the use of neuraxial techniques for labor analgesia do not increase the instance of cesarean delivery. In terms of neuraxial techniques, we should offer these in, um, for individuals with trial of labor after cesarean delivery. The old thought used to be that if you had a patient that was a TOLAC, or we used to call it VBAC, that the epidural would mask a uterine rupture, and that's been demonstrated not to be the case. Uh, in fact, the first indication of uterine rupture is usually loss of the fetal heart rate activity, and that should be the guide that our obstetric colleagues signal themselves to in terms of calling for a cesarean delivery because of uterine rupture. Moreover, it's appropriate to consider an early placement of that the epidural catheter. In fact, we do commonly at our own institution what are called prophylactic catheters, where before the parturient wants the activation of labor analgesia, but she might represent someone who will take some time in placing that analgesic technique, that will go ahead and place it early when there's calmness in the room, we have a little bit more time and thoughtfulness to place it, and then we can activate it at a later point in time. In fact, there are some individuals where we don't activate the catheter, we just have it present. Those are someone who wants natural childbirth throughout their whole experience, but perhaps they're high BMI, or perhaps they have a very poor airway that we don't want to negotiate, and as such, we do this prophylactic catheter. And to sh demonstrate the success of this approach, um, looking initially at the use of general anesthesia at the Brigham Women's Hospital from 1990 to 1995, we indicated that we have less than a 5% use, and we wanted to perhaps see if we could change that by using more prophylactic catheters, by thinking about epidural techniques and spinal techniques, even in crisis situations. And our, our use of general at the Brigham Women's Hospital now is 0.3%, and it's been 0.3% for the last decade. Um, we owe this in part because we do a lot of neuraxial techniques for labor analgesia, but we're also willing to place those prophylactic catheters in women who we don't want to entertain general anesthesia or manipulate their airway. In terms of single injection of spinal opioids, this was in part directed to some of the practices that we observed throughout the country. And what was happening was that some anesthesia groups don't uh, maintain an in-house group, and the, the sort of guidance by their local hospitals was if you inserted a catheter, that you would have to stay in-house. And so some practitioners were giving repeated spinals and then going home in the interim to go back to sleep and then come back later to do another repeat spinal. And in some cases, we'd hear of women getting five or six spinals during the course of the night in order for the, the anesthesia provider to stay at home. And we wanted this guidance to indicate that we think that a catheter-based approach is a superior way to go. Um, we want to move ourselves away from doing repeated spinals. 
um, for the process of analgesia during labor, and that we should think about using local anesthetics as well. What they were doing was just giving opioids only because that wouldn't cause hypotension, and if they administered local anesthetics, then they would have to stay in-house. So we're saying that a combination of the two is what is necessary, and that epidural catheters or spinal catheters should be utilized as well. So how about removal of that retained placenta? It's something that we've all handled and have to react to. And the questions I would pose here is, is there an optimal anesthetic technique for this process? Should we use the existing epidural catheter, even if it's laid fallow for a period of time? And finally, is there a role for nitroglycerin when we consider the removal of that placenta that seems to be adherent to the uterus? And when we think about these questions, we can also turn to the guidelines. And what the guidelines would say is that there's no preferred technique. However, if the epidural catheter is in situ, that you can activate this and utilize it during the course of your anesthetic for the removal of the placenta, that the risk of pulmonary aspiration always exists. So even though the baby's out and the uterus seems decompressed and there's no further sort of impact on the stomach, we recognize that gastric emptying and the changes in pregnancy don't go back to normal right after the birth of the fetus, that we still need to be concerned about pulmonary aspiration. And if major maternal hemorrhage is a consideration, sometimes freeing up your hands so that you can attend to the needs of the parturient is best. And so in that situation, a general anesthetic with an endotracheal tube is, is preferable. When we come to uterine relaxation, we can use nitroglycerin. And nitroglycerin does afford the relaxation of the uterus and does afford the separation of the placenta. In terms of the amount that you use, you use 50 mics, you give it IV, you wait 50 seconds so it can get to the uterus and start its activity, and then you allow the obstetric colleague to pull on the, pl the placenta. Um, we use that time frame, about 50 seconds, in order for it to have activity. And we've also been very confident in saying that you just need to start off with 50 mics. I must say there's obstetric guidance out there that says you can use 500 mics as a single IV bolus um, for the employment of a retained placenta. And as we all can recognize, that amount of nitroglycerin will cause immediate hypotension, perhaps even cardiovascular collapse, and just get you into a worse situation than only a retained placenta. How about anesthesia for cesarean delivery? It's something that we're certainly doing more frequently. Uh, in the United States, the incidence is about 34% cesarean delivery rate. Some places it's uh, slightly higher, including our own institution, because we have a high-risk population. But if you look internationally, it's amazing the differences that you see. I, I frequently go to Brazil to a hospital in Sao Paulo. It's the leading birthing institution in Sao Paulo. They have a 94% cesarean delivery rate, 94%. Quite amazing. Where, as you go to other places, Sub-Saharan Africa, I've been to some of those hospitals, they have less than a 1% rate of cesarean delivery. And it's just access to care that really prevents more of those from being done. The questions I would pose here is, do you have adequate equipment and resources in your labor and delivery suite, and specifically in your operating suite that you use for cesarean deliveries. Is there a preferred technique here? And also, do the fluid timing issues exist with analgesia as they do with anesthesia? And what about vasopressor selection? And getting here, we just wanted to indicate that the resources should be as same as any other operating room environment because complications can occur. And it's oftentimes, it seems like um, the labor suite is where they go to retire all the equipment. It's the dinosaur factory. It's where the oldest machines end up, where the oldest equipment. And that shouldn't be the case, because when we need this equipment, we really need it in a very vital way. In terms of general epidural and neuraxial techniques, there's no um, real advantage in terms of uh, fetal outcomes, but certainly neuroaxial techniques um, have demonstrated to have less of an impact on the fetus as well as the maternal circulation. Indwelling epidural catheters can be used and can, be, um, can activate analgesia to anesthesia in a very quick way. 
At our own institution, if we have some crisis situation, we use 3% chlorprocaine, we add bicarb to it, 8.4%. We use one cc of bicarb for every 10 cc as a local anesthetic. And what's been demonstrated by a nice study by Tony Lam out of Singapore is that you can convert a T10 analgesic to a T4 anesthetic with chlorprocaine and bicarb in less than three minutes. And we start dosing in the labor room. By the time we hit the OR, we have a functional anesthetic ready to go. In terms of intravenous fluid loading, we talked about this earlier, that nice um, editorial by Frederick Mercier stands true here. In fact, that study was, uh, his epidural, his editorial was actually about the use during cesarean delivery for spinal anesthesia. Ephedrine and phenylephrine, these are both acceptable. I usually tend to dose them based on heart rate and blood pressure. And if you want to look at guidance, work Nagan Ki out of Hong Kong has done a, a, a measure of remarkable studies that indicate that both are quite acceptable and can be used. In fact, in human clinical trials, there seems to be perhaps an improvement with phenylephrine rather than ephedrine. And we might see the pendulum swing to more and more phenylephrine use if we haven't already. And with neuroactive opioids, these are preferred over intermittent or interval parenteral opioids. How about tubal ligation and emergencies? When we think about this, the questions I would pose is, can you use that catheter that hasn't been utilized for a while? Should cell salvage be a part of a regular practice? And finally, what about difficult airway management? Should we handle that any different than any other operating room environment that we practice in? And when we think about this, we recognize that the fail rate is higher of an epidural catheter over the course of time, especially it hasn't been used. If it marks over 24 hours of time, the success rate of reactivating the epidural and getting a nice bilateral block decreases to under 90%. The timing, however, of postpartum tubal ligation should not compromise other care that's being delivered, and you should apply the same aspiration guidelines as you would to any other pregnant individual. Resource management, as I indicated, should be the same in the obstetric environment as anywhere else. And in terms of intraoperative cell salvage, this is a technique that's becoming more frequent. It is a little bit cumbersome. You do have to have individuals that know how to run the cell saver. Training is not difficult, and you can train your group to think about this. If you deal with a high-risk population, this might be something to consider. But even in our own institution, when we do over 10,000 deliveries a year, we have a very high-risk population um, patient. We've only used this this year in just one patient. And that was in a Jehovah's Witness patient that was, if she said unconscious, she was willing to accept blood products. Um, but she had a lot of antibodies. And when we looked in Boston, there were no compatible blood units for her. We looked in New England, no compatible blood units. We looked through the entire United States. There were three units of blood that were available and compatible with her, her type. So we shipped those three units to our, our center. We also set up interrupt trip blood salvage. And um, we did, in fact, use that during the case. We did not have to use the other sort of blood products that we had found for her. In terms of equipment and airway emergencies, we really um, want to remark that you have to have the difficult airway carts available. Uh, there was one survey that was done in the UK, interesting survey that revealed that there were two units where the difficult airway cart was at another hospital located 15 minutes away. And if they had a signal for it, they'd call the cab company put the cart into the back of the cab, and then bring it over. And these types of geographic differences, even between institutions, but even within institutions, should not happen. We should have a difficult airway cart at our labor and delivery suite. And we should be comfortable with employing the algorithms, such as the use of LMA. LMA has been a lifesaver, and we use in our own institution a simple LMA, and we use it um, although there's alternatives available, like the ProSeal and other types of uh, LMAs where you can use aspiration, we use the simple LMA because there's been a number of studies that indicate that the success of placement for the simple LMA is like 
whereas the ProCL drops to 92%, and some of the other more sophisticated LMAs even below 90% sometimes. So a simple LMA is what we utilize on a regular basis. And we're just rewriting a companion piece, or writing a companion piece. Um, Brendan Carvalho, who sits in the back there, is their mastermind behind uh, this um, writing of a companion piece about use of ACLS uh, in women who are pregnant. And what we indicate there is that incision should be started within four minutes with the hope of delivery at five minutes. And to do it right there in the labor and delivery room is, if that's where the arrest occurs. So what have we talked about with these guidelines? We started off with evaluation. We looked at aspiration prophylaxis. We considered labor analgesia as well as cesarean delivery anesthesia. We also thought about the issues of tubal ligations and postpartum uh, events such as retained placenta. And finally, we looked at emergencies. All these guidelines are still relevant to our care. They confirm the practice that many of you are doing right now. And we should consider whether we should change our practices if we don't have them all applied. But I encourage you to read these documents. They're freely available. I've covered the highlights for you. Um, and I'm sure your practices are very consistent with good practice. We understand that there is that gap between research, guidelines, and then the administration onto our clinical floors. And we should work towards reducing that gap when possible. And I do look forward to some of the questions that you might have in the question and answering period. Thank you very much for your attention.